Now, today is very special because it is the launch of the PUSH Festival. Uh, and I'm very excited. It's one of my favorite festivals in the city. And I hope you all have already um, looked at the lineup and have picked some incredible shows that you are planning on attending already. Uh, now we're here because the PUSH Festival uh, partnered with the Vancouver Public Library to bring an installation to the Central Library. And so we've decided to host this conversation about the important issues that this installation addresses. Now, the installation is a work by Steve Lambert, and it's a big street level billboard that says capitalism works for me, and then you have true or false. And so it's, a, it's gonna be on display uh, on Robson Street in the Central Library, and it asks you to vote on whether capitalism works for you. Now, there's gonna be some facilitators engaging visitors in the conversation before you vote. So you can take a moment to consider your life and your economic system before voting. So at the end of the run, uh, there's gonna be a big tally of the votes on display. So you will be able to see what Vancouverites really think about capitalism. Now, this installation is opening this Saturday um, at uh, 11.30 a.m. and it's going on until Monday. So it's gonna be there for Saturday, Sunday, and Monday from 11.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, if you wanna read more about that and check out the schedule, of course, you probably didn't memorize what I just said. We're gonna put a link in the chat so that you can see that directly. Now, today, uh, we invited a panel of experts to discuss whether capitalism is working for us. And I think this is a particularly important moment for us to have this discussion after two years of a pandemic that has exposed deep inequities in our society and highlighted some critical flaws in the ways that we organize our economy. Now, we also experienced massive fires caused by a deadly heat dome event. We also saw devastating floods that caused, caused by atmospheric rivers and a number of other climate emergencies that affected communities across the country, which can be directly linked to our systems and our ideologies of consumption and production. So to discuss all that, I'm excited to introduce today's speakers. So Alejandra, Anita, Joel, Steve, can you please join me on stage? Wonderful. Hi, nice to see you all. So Steve Lambert, he's an artist and an activist known for large scale public projects that engage audiences on difficult topics. He's an assistant professor of SUNY Purchase and the co-founder and co-director of the Center for Artistic Activism. Thank you for being here. Thanks, yeah. Alejandra Bravo is the director of leadership and training at the Broadband Institute. And she has spent 25 years working on progressive social change with grassroots immigrant and labor groups. She's worked as a community organizer, a political staff, and a city council candidate in Toronto. Thank you for being here, Alejandra. Hi. Joel Bacan is a renowned legal scholar and professor of law at the University of British Columbia. He is the author of the best-selling books, The Corporation and The New Corporation, and the co-creator of the award-winning documentaries of the same names, The Corporation and The New Corporation. Thanks, Joel, nice to see you. Thanks. And Anita Bath is the host and frontline investigative reporter with CBC New Vancouver News flagship supper hour program at 6 p.m. Now in her 10 year journalism career, Anita has won numerous awards for her in-depth reporting on breaking news stories. Thank you for joining us today, Anita. Thanks for having me. Now, um, well, thank you all for having, for having uh, the time to, to do this today. And um, Anita, it's, the floor is yours, take it away. Thanks, Jorge. I'm really excited to be here today on behalf of CBC Vancouver News and excited for the conversation that we're going to have. So we want to dive right into it. But first, I do want to mention that we also want audience participation. So please do send in your questions. And at the end of our discussion that we're starting off with, we will try to get to as many audience questions as we can. Okay, let's get started. Um, you know, as Jorge mentioned, the pandemic has really upended our lives. It's absolutely strained our healthcare systems. It's caused major rifts in our economy. It's made the many of the inequities in our society more visible. So I wanna ask who is getting left behind here? And Alejandra, I'd like to start with you. Well, um, you know, the majority, the majority of people and um, the planet, the environment that we live in. I mean, just look at taxation. Um, money that people earn when they work is taxed the same way that the cash, the rich has dashed during this profit taking time in the pandemic. Um, and there's lots of ways for them to avoid taxes on top of that. You've talked about a lot of the things that are really challenging right now around the pandemic and the healthcare system. It's like this reckoning is overdue because right now it's like, it's, it's not just that, it's the housing crisis, it's the climate crisis. 
Um, it's the reality that for uh, most people, um, they're working, you know, the, the, the prospect of the future isn't a standard employment contract where you can have sick days and when you can have a pension. We're talking about the growth of gig work, um, people unable um, to actually access the necessities of life and, it, you know, the, the commod commodification of everything that we need to exist is something that's that's harmful and we can't get any uh, real action on the climate crisis and when i think about what people in british columbia have been facing and are going to continue to face i mean we're this thing is long overdue but uh, but i do want to say that this is particularly difficult for um for uh, people who who have long had had uh, to face uh challenges not just during the pandemic but before racialized workers, uh, workers working in precarious conditions, and the reality of this country, which is built on colonialism. And, you know, Indigenous people have suffered um, for a long time uh, under the system of injustice. Um, but at the same time, I think the working class and this coalition of people um, who have most impacted are actually going to lead uh, the way into the future as we come up with alternatives and challenge the system that we're facing. Okay, and Joel, you obviously have a background in looking at the corporation's role in all of this. So can you talk about who people are blaming uh, for, for some of the things that Alejandra mentioned there? Yeah, I mean, I agree with everything that Alejandra has, um, has said. And I think to, to put it in some context, when we think about the pandemic as a crisis that we're facing, or we think about climate change, or we think about inequality, I think that the problem to, to get back to the, the piece that's at issue here, capitalism, um, I think the problem with capitalism in relation to all these things, and more generally in relation to our, to our health, our mental health, our ability to thrive as human beings, to create and make art and culture, all of these things that make us human, that make our world a decent place to live. The problem with capitalism is inherent in the very word that's so prominent in the installation, capitalism. So if you put a dash between those two things and think of each word, um, capital, what is capital, right? In effect, capital is the profit. And I don't want to get too uh, Marxian or Pikittian or whatever, but capital is the profit that's extracted from an investment. Uh, it's the return. So for capitalism, the value of a tree or the value of land or the value of non-human animals or the atmosphere lies only, only in the profit that can be extracted from it, cutting down the tree and selling it as lumber, digging up the land and pumping out oil, uh, using the animal for food or the atmosphere as a carbon dump. And the problem is that our value as human beings in terms of capital is just what can be extracted from us as labor, what can be extracted from us as consumers, and what can be extracted from us uh, in terms of data these days. So if that's capital and we attach an ism to it, then what that means is the fundamental goal of our society is to do that. The overarching principle of our society is to do that, is to turn everything into a resource from which you can extract capital and not to see it in other terms, whether it's workers or land or the atmosphere or all of these other things. And I think the problem when we confront the pandemic or any of these things is it's like we end up in a cul-de-sac, a political and a intellectual and an actual social cul-de-sac. And that is we live in a society that glorifies, that pushes, that deifies this thing called capital and says it's the ism, it's the telos, it's the goal. But we're confronting these human problems that we want to deal with in terms of other values, like the inherent value of being human. You should be able to get health care. You should be able to get a vaccine. Uh, yet, of course, big corporations own the intellectual property rights. The vaccines aren't getting out. So I think the structural problem is that we can never see a problem other than creating capital as an end in itself. Everything is subordinate to that. And that is very messed up. And I think the pandemic is showing us not just in this country, but globally, uh, why. 
Well, and that was my next question actually to Steve, because I want to go a little further on that idea of capitalism um, being about how much can be extracted from us. Steve, can you pull on that a little more in terms of how much have you seen uh, people's stance uh, around this and, and their stance against this um, change because of the pandemic? Well, what Joel pointed out about like how this impacts the way that we think and what we imagine is possible is, is a huge part of this. So um, in, I started working with a group called Universities Allied for Essential Medicines uh, right before the pandemic started. And why universities? Because um, universities do a lot of the research on pharmaceuticals. There's a the, the, if you ask a pharmaceutical executive, they'll say they do a lot of the research and they take on all this risk. And that's why the cost of the drugs are so high is because they need to get a return on all this money that they're investing. But they really don't invest much at all in R&D. It happens through public taxpayer funds. So the what, what's called the Moderna vaccine was actually developed like at Vanderbilt University. It was developed at a bunch of different universities over the last 20 years. And US taxpayers paid through it, through grants from the National Institutes of Health. And now not only is Moderna like have this monopoly license that allows them to charge whatever they want, even though we already paid for it, the contracts that the NIH makes are terrible. They don't attach any terms around um, accessibility and affordability. And um, even though we paid for this vaccine to be developed and we can't somehow can't get them to share the recipe with other countries. And so what does that mean? They can't develop vaccines. Moderna's vaccine doesn't require a cold chain and Pfizer's does. They've, they're, they're mRNA vaccines, both of them, but Pfizer's requires a cold chain. There's something that they figured out that they're not sharing that would could potentially eliminate the need for the cold chain in all these countries around the world. And so, um, what does this mean? It means needless suffering and death. And I think that that's just horrific, especially, and, and it's so hard for us to imagine another way or to understand that like, no, they actually didn't, they didn't develop anything. All they did is figure out a way to produce and sell it. They're basically like a government contractor. But can all of that innovation, let's say with vaccines and, and innovation in general still live on without capitalism? Um, it does already because it's, you know, we do it through universities. Um, it's not in the interest uh, of a pharmaceutical company to do research on um, a novel disease, right? Because it may never happen. Um, what they like to do is to do things that um, are ongoing conditions that require you to take that medication. You know, that, that's like the most profitable version. It's to, to find treatments for ongoing conditions that might last your whole life. But um, there are a whole uh, host of neglected tropical diseases that, you know, uh, there's just no market for, because um, in more developed countries, things like sanitation and uh, have eliminated the need for them. So the people in those countries are suffering and dying from, from diseases that are neglected, right, by, by the industry because they, there's no market for them. Okay, and if we're not talking about innovation around um, science and vaccines, but we're talking about innovation around goods and technology and all of that, can that still live on without capitalism? Um, Alejandro, do you wanna to touch on that? 100%, I was dying to jump in here. I think about economist Mariana Mazzucato, who uh, tells us that the great, the, the majority of things in your iPhone, like that all of the innovations were publicly funded. Um, every, every kind of uh, discovery that is done through the military, for example, that's publicly funded and the internet that's publicly funded development. So there, and, and who actually does the, is the creator and the creativity, like by pooling our, like our resources with, through taxes and having government steward that, we have an educated workforce, a healthy workforce. Um, we, we, we can do the research and, and a lot of this isn't just about creating things to consume, but also philosophers like ethics, that's all funded through a public system. And you know, the idea that capital is innovative, it just completely excludes the agency of workers who are constantly, whether it was on an old assembly line 
um, or in the present are the ones that are finding like ways to do uh, processes more effectively. Um, I think the question about why we don't know these things has to do with the reality that the dominant narratives are all set by the people who have the most uh, stake because they they own the capital and control it. And and you know we're getting into situations here where you know we we get like a, a Bezos or a or a monk they're flying to space. You know a single a single trip to the to space is like a lifetime of carbon footprint for everyone else. Um, these, these are just, these are not true innovators. And I think that we need to think about uh, putting some guardrails, um, like uh, like Joel said earlier, around uh, around what, how they can use the, how they, and how they can shape our society. Like if we started to think about how to regulate um, tech, which, you know, it has so much control over, um, over our minds and our economy right now, um, we, you know, we could think about, uh, we could think about um, preventing what I think is going to look like a catastrophe later, where this like tech capital is accumulating and pretty soon we're all going to be flying Air Amazon and, and staying at an Amazon hotel, um, unaccountable, and that, that's actually just an issue of political will. Um, political priorities and and going back to who are the creators who are the innovators it's we the people are are those are the innovators and the creators and there's a bunch of areas of work that doesn't have um, that don't have to do with like producing things that are consumed and that has to do with care work care you know we're all going to be um, carers or cared for at some point in our lives and if we reoriented our priorities as a society then what an innovation it would, it would be to deal with the mental health crisis, to um, house and, to, and take care of our elders uh, with compassion and the dignity that they deserve, to provide childcare that develops children sooner. If you invest in um, zero, the ages zero to six, you see huge payoff later. So it's just an, it's an issue of, uh, to me, about redefining um, and reconceiving about what, what actually has value in society and, and who the agents of change are and, and who are the agents that are going to find solutions to the problems that we face. Well, Joel, how hard is it to make that shift for society? Uh, it's, it's not, in theory, that difficult. It has a lot to do with, um, with public consciousness, which I think has been underlying a lot of this discussion with our sense of inevitability that capitalism has to operate the way that it does with our sense that um, with our sort of lack of ability to imagine the public, the nonprofit investment in everything that's happening. I mean, look, you're sitting at the CBC, a publicly funded enterprise. We're at the Vancouver Public Library, a publicly funded enterprise. I work at a university. Steve works at a university, publicly funded. I mean, you know, it. it there is a massive investment of public money. And, and Steve and Ale, Ale, Alejandra are absolutely right that just about every innovation we can look at, whether it's the internal combustion engine or it's batteries or it's vaccines or it's chemotherapy technologies, just about every innovation that we can look at that is profitable has a basis in a massive public investment without which it couldn't happen, uh, including the airwaves that and Wi-Fi and, and internet and everything else that we're using right now. So we're in a system where the public investment is made invisible in effect. And all that we can see are the so-called innovators who are simply rent seeking on the public investment to make profit. And that is an inability to imagine the reality as it actually exists. In other words, our imaginations, our political economic imaginations have been hijacked by an ideology that is pumped out, that makes corporations and business seem heroic, that makes them seem benevolent. I mean, one of the main points of my new book and film is to look at this whole apparent corporate benevolence, this shift in corporate mythology towards corporations saying, we're the good guys now, we care, uh, stakeholder capitalism, sustainability. My argument is that it's a wolf in sheep's clothing. It looks very nice, but really it's a play for complete power. It's corporations saying, we're like governments now. 
we care about the public interest. And look at those governments, they're not working anymore. So let us take over. Um, and, and so that that's the problem. Now, I think it's really important in this discussion to make this point. Capitalism is not the same thing as a market economy. There is an argument that a market economy is an effective policy tool for stimulating innovation, for organizing trade, for organizing production. I'm going to say there's an argument for that. Um, and most socialist systems, for example, have market economies. Um, those two things and the sort of most socialist advocates, including people like Thomas Piketty, are not against markets. What they're against is capitalism, because what capitalism does is it says the market is not a tool. It's not a means to the end of the public good in need of being regulated to ensure that it does serve the public good. What it is, is it's an end in itself. That is what capitalism does. It inverts the market economy into the totality of our telos, of our expectations, of our thinking, of our imaginations, of our ideologies, and of our practices. And so I think, you know, a lot of people say, oh, they hear a conversation like this, and oh, what, are you guys saying communism? And I think it's important to say no, not necessarily. I mean, I'm, I don't want to speak for Stephen. I, I, you know, I can't speak for everybody here, obviously. But I'm going to let them jump in here in a sec, Joel. So just wrap up your. Yeah. So, so, so the point is, I think we can accept market economies as tools for public policy and the social good without accepting capitalism. Steve and Alejandro, I know you're both ready to jump in. Steve, let's start with you. Well, I get asked all the time. You know, people try to turn the "Does capitalism work for you?" into a simpler question, like is capitalism better than a uh, brutal dictatorship? And it's like, yeah, it is, <laughs> you know? Um, uh, and and that's, a, that's a much easier question to answer. But, um, and then they'll say, well, what are, what's the alternative? And I'll say their alternatives are in, infinite. You know, the way that we implement capitalism in the United States is different than how you implement capitalism in Canada. It's how, different than how they implement capitalism in any nation you pick, right? Just like the way they've implemented socialism in Vietnam is different than China and different than other countries, right? So in a democracy, we should be able to realize, hey, maybe this isn't working best for the population and what would and make those changes. Um, but again, you know, I mean, we're, I think the point about how it impacts our imagination and what's possible in the world. Like it's what's possible becomes very narrow. It has to fit within things that make a profit. <laughs> and, but what's really possible is, is broad. And it takes a little exercise to be able to, to think in that way. Alejandra, I'll, I'll give the floor to you, but can you also um, talk, pull a little further on what Steve's saying and talk about um, how each country then goes about implementing that? And does one country need to take the lead? Hmm. Well, I mean, I don't think that that one single country, um, I mean, we, we, there's a lot of agency within the populations of those countries, but we are in a global system. And there are, you know, if we want to practice global solidarity, then we need to pay attention to that. But I, I, on that particular point, I think there's a lot of hope right now. Um, you know, I'm from, I was born in Chile. I was a, a, a refugee, came to Canada. And you look at Latin America right now, there's a huge pushback on the kind of, um, capitalism that is being experienced worldwide. And I'm going to say, that I think it's important to say it's neoliberal capitalism. Um, it's sort of capitalism on steroids and because cap private capital is hungry. Like there's this um, limitless upward extraction of, of life and wealth um, from people to an ever shrinking group of elites. And, and so what we're, it's like a centrifugal force, right? It's like, it's positioning the state as a sort of authoritarian enabler of this wealth concentration. And that's how it's been experienced in lots of places in the world. Um, in, in my country of origin, um, there was a socialist government. Um, they were making some of the changes that we're talking about here to take care of people. Um, there was a military coup and that was the, you know, the, the Chicago boys and neoliberal thinkers implemented this, this system there. Um, and, and, you know, it's it, it's one of the things about this kind of uh, neoliberalism is that it requires a lot of repression. So you see in, in the, you know, in North America, 
um, local police forces are getting buying tanks. And, um, you know, it maybe it doesn't take a military coup, but we're going to increasingly see, I think, the, the role of the police in, um, in sort of disciplining people that are resisting and whether that's with um, uh, indigenous people and resource extraction um, and projects and or like the in, in Toronto, the removal of, of people living in encampments with nowhere to go in a, in a cold snap. So where's the hope here and where can one country lead? Well, let's look at something like um, Cuba, for example, which is has a like a mixed economy. There is a market. Um, half of the like half of the agricultural production is in the hand of hands of worker co-ops. They came up with a bunch of vaccines without capital and <laughs> capitalism, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. private capital, and some of them can don't even need to have cold storage, so they can be used in areas where there is no refrigeration. And they have one vaccine that is available for ages two to five, which we don't have here available. Um, but going back to my country of origin, um, recently a new president was elected um, and he had been a student organizer. And one of the things that he said is that this might be the birthplace of neoliberalism, but it's where it's going to go to die. So we're, the fact that, that the Vancouver Public Library is hosting this conversation, that, there's a, that artists are attending to it, that filmmakers are attending to it, and that we're pivoting to trying to imagine what an alternative is, I think that's the real top line news is that this shift in, in consciousness and public opinion. And um, that's, I think, the only way that we're going to challenge the, the real crisis of inequality and, and racism and, and exclusion and, and uh, climate that we're facing right now. So, Steve, we're here today because of an art installation you created in, in 2011 that opens at the VPL uh, at the Central Library as part of the Push Festival. The installation gets people to reflect on whether capitalism works for them. So after 10 years of showing this installation around the world, what have you learned about people's ideas about capitalism? Basically, how do they form their opinions about it? Um, yeah, it's that's hard to summarize because I've literally talked to thousands of people. Um, and there is a guy, uh, a linguist and sociologist, I think, who made a book that's based on the responses of people to the sign and like how they how they use language to make sense of capitalism. Um, so there's a whole book. But um, uh, what I would say is like, there's definitely patterns I see um, among people and there are certainly people that this system has worked for and they'll come, you know, and uh, like in the United States, just to kind of generalize, these are based on real experiences, you know, but there'd be like a person who's retired, um, usually male and describes like working at one job their whole life. And that um, they say, you know, I worked this one job, I made these investments, I'm retired now. I think it works for me. And I will say, I think it did too. You know, like there, you seem happy and you have what you need. Um, and at the same time, we can see that, you know, 44 people back here said that it didn't work. And I can tell you that uh, most of them haven't had one job their whole life. You're very lucky. And that person will, usually will say, yeah, that's true. You know, like, I don't think my kids are going to have the same experience. So, um, so, what I'm pushing for with all of it is, is to not have, I don't know how much you have of this here in Canada, but in the United States, there, there's like just an assumption that capitalism, while it's flawed, is the best and only way. And that everything else leads to murder and chaos, you know. And so getting people to uh, slow down and not be as reactive and to think, you know, yeah, from everything from it, it yeah, it, do, it does, it did kind of work for me, but it doesn't work for everyone. And there was, there's a cost to that, to, um, to uh, even for people that say it doesn't work, um, that, that they are, that, that there's some privilege in that. And then ultimately um, to feel that a sense of agency, like, hey, this, this isn't just na the natural order. We didn't just evolve into this. There are changes we can make. And, and, I, and I'm open to like being more thoughtful about that. And that's like, for most people, I would say that's what happens. There's always like a few stubborn people that are never gonna change their minds and they are welcome to come. But um, yeah, like the idea is, is through this process of like thinking really about my life 
how does this work? You know, um, and what would it mean for it to work? And if I'm uncomfortable with how it affects other people, does that work for me? You know, that's not a question that um, I think comes up at a normal cocktail party. And so I'm trying to create a place where, where that can happen. Well, I just want to point out Lorenza's comment. She says, I can confirm I've been living in the USA for the past 12 years and criticizing capitalism leads to being called a communist, Sai. Yeah. So pulling on what you're saying. Um, Joel, in your book, The Corporation, you presented a strong critique of capitalism by analyzing the legal structure of corporations. In those works, you diagnose the behavior of corporations as that of psychopaths. So um, in recent years, we've also seen the, the rise of benefit corporations and social enterprises. So do you think that these new kinds of corporations can help solve some of the problems that you've identified? Yeah, I think that's a that's a great question. And I actually deal with it in my second book, The New Corporation. Um, yeah, the first book, I basically look at corporate law and I make the point that corporate law requires the managers and directors of corporations to always act in the best interests of the company, which means its shareholders. So corporations are legally required to put the production of capital above all other values. So it institutionalizes literally the imperatives of the capitalist system as a whole. And two things have happened since the first book and film that led me to, uh, to do the, um, the second book and film. One is every problem that I looked at in the first book and film got worse, whether it was climate change, inequality, exploitation of workers, all of it. Uh, the degradation of democracy, every single thing got worse. And in the meantime, corporations were saying that they had gotten better. And it was that sort of contradiction that really drove me to do the second film and book. And in the second film and book, I do look at B corporations and benefit corporations. Um, and just to try to encapsulate my summary um, or my, my argument by way of summary, the argument is basically that from my perspective, the B Corp movement is more part of the problem than the solution. And the reason for that is that it taps into the idea that we don't need to regulate corporations. Mm -hmm. We simply need to get them to voluntarily agree to a set of standards because the B Corps aren't legislated in any way. They're just a matter of agreement uh, with some company like the B Lab a nonprofit corporation to get a certification. So they're kind of like uh, certifications of organic or fair trade or whatever. Um, they are not a substitute for regulation, but they are part of the movement to suggest we don't need regulation anymore because now look, we have the B Corp. Now look, we have social responsibility. Now look, we have the woke corporation. All of that is aimed at suggesting we don't need mandatory laws to tell corporations to respect the environment and social good. They'll do it on their own and they'll get a little nice certification that they can stamp on their products. So um, now the motivations and the spirit and a lot of the, the good work that goes on around B Corps or social responsibility, sustainability, I'm not denigrating that. I think that comes from true uh, a desire for businesses to do good. But what I am saying is that the, the lodestar that's being followed there is really one of privatized self-regulation. And on a larger scale, that is highly problematic. And that's making a lot of the problems we have environmentally and socially worse. Alejandro, do you wanna jump in? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a couple of things. One, it's not just the rules that govern corporations that I think uh, lead to exploitation. So the, in, in every kind of like dispossession from, from colonization all the way through um, gentrification in communities that are working class with highly racialized, that's encoded into every rule, particularly municipal planning rules. Um, that help, you know, the, that at, on the other end, corporations then buy up land, which is 20% of the home ownership in this country now is, is done by, uh, is by corporations. But the second thing is around this, like, I, I agree with you um, that Joel, that the sort of the altruistic corporation or the altruistic vehicle for the corporation is um, not the solution. 
Um, there's also uh, for the reasons that you outlined, but to add something around agency, like we don't need any more saviors, like things that we can, I, one of the challenges I think is that um, individualizing and saying like, you know, this smart person is gonna create a social enterprise, great. Um, but I think democratizing the economy, um, making sure that people have more say in you know, economic activity that, that workers claim the, you know, the innovation work that they, the role that they play in, in, um, in, in production and in offering services and in caring for people. Um, I think the, the question about, um, you know, this issue is like, if we're, we continue to lift up these technocrats, professionals who say, trust us, you know, we're going to get to net zero, we're going to solve uh, this problem with training. Um, it reminds me of all the kind of poverty measuring that's been happening in this country for the last uh, 15 years, um, ranking poverty. But guess what? More people are homeless, more people are hungry. I think that at the core of the challenge and, and one of the destructive things about the neoliberal capitalist state that we're in now is just how much um, solidarity has been eroded between people. And I think that it's like building the power through social movements and organizing and, and fighting in elections um, is going to tap the reality that people have inherent power and we have um, the capacity to contribute our talents and our knowledge. Um, and that, you know, when, once we, when we start to, as individuals and, and communities and workers start to claim the stake that we have in the economy, I think that would, that, you know, that goes a long way. And, and the reason I raise this is that, um, you know, that I think that with capitalism is a threat to itself. Like the people have lost a lot of faith in dem democratic institutions in this country. You know, I just knocked on a lot of doors in a federal election campaign and I talked to many people who don't trust doctors, don't trust public health, don't mm -hmm. wanna get vaccinated. Um, this kind of like anti-establishment, right? That doesn't believe in, in, you know, that media tell the truth or the political parties that, um, is combining with this kind of male chauvinist, xenophobia, xenophobic, uh, white supremacist, um, right? And, you know, I think on the progressive side, on the left side where I belong, like we need to be really conscious of how that's being shaped with people, um, you know, workers and communities, the, the anti-establishment part is attractive because underneath there's some real grievances, lack of power, lack of capacity to shape their own lives. And I think that the ultimate thing here is that if people, if we don't see our lives and our livelihoods improved, um, that's really, you know, that that is, erodes the capacity of people who want to build a better alternative that's more caring and sustainable in the future. Um, because the base is getting eaten, uh, the base of people that could potentially fight for that better future is getting very much shifting and being attracted to this anti-authoritarianism piece. So I, you know, I think that um, I think that the solutions have to go through uh, a, like some transformations around economic systems and structures and and some political transformation so that we can have. For example, like uh, um, if we had a proportional representation system, we would have a different government. Um, so it's it's all hands on deck. It's not like corporations as one piece, and then there's a lot of other pieces that have to do with how we turn this around and and take our power back. Thanks, Alejandra. I want to get to audience questions now. So once again, you, the audience, please make sure you're sending in your questions. We've got a few to start off with. Um, Christina is asking, and Steve, I'll get you to jump on this. Why is it that people with disabilities and chronic illness are continually left out of discussions like this? Is it because of the perceived understanding that these people do not contribute economically to society, that they have no value in capitalist productivity and priorities? Um, I mean, we can we can guess, right? But the thing is, is that we, we, all of us are going to experience that in some way at some point in our life, right? Um, we all experience diminished capacity. And I think it kind of goes back to what Joel talked about before, which is that you're only seen in this sort of value of the money that you have uh, or the money that you can create, right? Like when you work for someone else, the reason that they're paying you is because they can make more money by paying you, right? Like you're producing more than they're paying you. That's how it works. So um, in a way, in this system, those people aren't as valuable in that way, right? Um, but we all know that 
those people can be incredibly valuable. Like everyone can be incredibly value if you, valuable if you give them a role. And I think it's like these old patterns um, uh, that, I, I mean, it, it's weird how it keeps coming back to this, how this impacts the way that we think, right? About who is valuable in the world um, and the ways that they are. Thank you. This next question is for Joel. Should corporations only be permitted to operate as public utilities? So it, it is the future in cooperatives? This question comes from Chris to Joel. I think there's a lot more room than we currently allow for, uh, for other modes of um, business organization, uh, workers cooperatives, consumer cooperatives, um, all kinds of interesting uh, sort of common ways of production that are not for profit. I mean, I think there's, I can't remember his name, but there's a, uh, a physician, a, a medical uh, school professor at the University of Texas who's developed a, a vaccine um, that is for COVID that's based on more traditional antiviral vaccine mechanisms. So it's not mRNA, uh, but it's, it's more like the hep the hepatitis uh, vaccine. Um, and he's doing all of this on a totally nonprofit basis for the public good. Uh, and he's producing it in India and other places. You don't hear about it much in the mainstream media, I think because he's doing it on a nonprofit basis. But apparently it's a very effective vaccine with few side effects. And I haven't looked a lot into it, but the very fact that I didn't even know about it until I just came across this obscure reference to it. And yet it seems like huge news or it should be huge news. Mm -hmm. But maybe the reason it's not is 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 because of that. Um, so I think, yes, there are many, many different ways to organize production and many better ways that are based on um, on other values than simply extracting capital. Having said that, I'm not I don't, in my work, say we should do away with corporations. They do a few things really well. Um, what they do really well is they accumulate large uh, pools of capital in order to fund large kinds of enterprise. And so they're very good financing vehicles. So I haven't sort of thought far enough along to think about a society where there are no business corporations at all. But my plea is simply in the short term, can we stop seeing them, deifying them as these ends in themselves, as I mentioned before, and see them as policy tools? Where and how is production best organized in a way that they are used as financing vehicles? And then in other places, where can we bring in other kinds of production so that we have a kind of mix of productive methods that ultimately is best for those who are doing the work and for those who need the products and services uh, that are being created. And, uh, you know, care was mentioned, for example. I'm not sure that care should be delivered um, through for-profit corporations, uh, care of the elderly, uh, broadcasting. I think there's a huge place for public broadcasters as what you're doing, universities. We have so many places where we produce goods and services that are very needed that are done on a non-corporate, uh, non-profit model. Uh, and getting back to the previous discussion, I think most of the innovations in our society come from those places. It's only because the myths that we live by that we somehow think they come from Elon Musk and, you know, and Jeff Bezos. Thanks, Joel. Okay, I want to try and get to as many questions as I can. This next one is for Alejandra. Uh, it's, it's, they want you to comment on this. Capitalism works if it pays a fair wage to all employees and ensures a reasonable profit for companies to expand and provide research. Capitalism should not reward shareholders or CEOs with massive wealth. It's time to have a regulated government cap on capitalism. I think that um, the cap could be on maximum wealth. We always talk about minimum wage. What about maximum wage? Um, you know, I think that the the, the question, the, the answer I would give is that, is the society and the economy actually allowing people to um, enjoy and, and have the things that they need to live a good life? So from my perspective, it's no, in, in our capitalist uh, system in Canada, um, we haven't enshrined or protected um, social and, and economic rights. Um, there is no right to housing. There is no right to education enshrined constitutionally, for example. 
And, and actually realizing those rights would mean reformulating um, who, who um, um, the activity. It would limit uh, you know, the corporate uh, massive buy of, of housing stock. It would change the relationship, the contractual relationship between the worker and the employer. And you know, I, th I, I want to address the, a little bit the question about like the alternative ways of organizing um, production. I mean, Canada has a huge uh, cooperative and uh, um, history. When when people were starving in Atlantic Canada, the Anagonish movement uh, built worker cooperatives. They taught each other how to read. They and they control capital through credit unions. So it's it's kind of part of our DNA. Um, I think that that really uh, like starting from from what people need to live, like for example, the, the care work thing, like people that there should be no profit taking in, in, in that space. And there are some things that have to do with like the free free mobility, um, you know, the amount of, the amount that we're investing in policing to to protect largely um, private interests that are really, I think, harmful. And so the measure is will will workers get a good wage? Um, I mean, they're not. So there are no paid, like legislative paid sick days um, across uniformly across this country, even during a pandemic. And the you know the two dollar um, pay that was added for grocery store workers was removed by very profitable corporations. So um, you know I think this has to do with us like withdrawing our consent for a system that is hurting a lot of people. Thank you. Steve, this one is for you from Joseph. Is the idea of zero growth in compliance with the core basis of capitalism, or could it somehow be implemented into our life full of products, gadgets, and other very necessary things that we live with? Um, you know, there's a, 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 a writer from Vancouver that I'm always, it's one of the most mind-blowing books I've read in a while. Um, it's called... It's, the guy's name's Lee Phillips, and he wrote um, Austerity Ecology and the Collapse Porn Addicts, which is, if you have a good sense of humor, it's very funny. I laughed a lot. Um, but uh, what he talks about is that we, that there's this instinct of like, oh, we need to go backwards, right? Like we need to go to a more simpler way. And that, that that's actually, that austerity, it, it very much aligns with the austerity arg argument, but also um, that you know, there, there's something to be said about figuring out a way to move forward in a way that where we, technology actually helps all of us. Um, and um, and he goes about making good arguments for it and, and envisioning that. And I think that that's really important. But the way that I think, you know, the, the, the simplest way of uh, controlling this is, is really through regulation, you know, like socialism is the democratic control of the economy. Right where people actually have an impact. It's not just the free market. It's not like un, out of control or controlled by the most wealthy. Um, and I worked a lot in Western Africa and, and the West, West Africa and the Western Balkans on corruption. And there was uh, something that one of the Nigerian uh, folks we were working with told me, which was, I guess it's a saying there, which is if you put food in front of a goat, the goat will eat it. And so if you create any opportunity for a corporation to like, you know, make money at the expense of people, like what do you expect them to do, right? And so the B corporation thing is like, when that happens, you can say, oh, well, why don't these other, why isn't Jeff Bezos just be better person and like make better choices? Why doesn't Elon Musk or anyone, why does my boss not do it better? Because there is this better way. Um, we can't rely on individual people like that. Like we have to, again, think of like how we create a system where we're not putting food in front of the goat and expecting the goat to behave, you know, like you just don't put the food there. <laughs> well, so this next question, um, is for Joel and Steven kind of pulls on that. So Margaret says that capitalism controls, colonizes our imaginations to such a degree that we have great difficulty imagining anything else. Steve suggests that we can relearn our ways of seeing. Can the panelists give any tips for unbrainwashing ourselves? Um, Joel, I'll let you go, but we have to keep uh, these answers short because we've only got time for one other question after this. 
I read my book and watch my movie. Not that not that I want to promote, but I think uh, go and see go and see Steve's um, uh, uh, installation. Uh, go to the Broadbent Institute's website and look at the various reports that they provide. There's so much being produced that tries to get at the truth and values of all of this. It's just a question of going and finding it. The VPL is full of stuff to read and to look at. For what it's worth, Joel, I watched your movie when it came out. Hmm, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> not the first one, but not maybe the second it, one yet. Yeah, not the second one yet, but you know, maybe, maybe it worked. <laughs> All right, we have time for one last question, and I'm going to start with Alejandro on this, but this person would like all panelists to respond. How and why are the oppressions of women so vital to capitalism? Well, I mean, women are um, reproduce families, reproduce workers, um, and there's a lot of the, the question about how um, sort of income has been so affiliated with work is, is problematic. There's a lot of work that, that women do um, that is, it, it's, not, it's not wage work, um, but it's absolutely essential. So I think that the question about, about like this, what socialists and social democrats and democratic socialists believe is that people have value within themselves and should be taken care of based on the reality that they exist. And that, this goes to the same with the, the comment around people living with disabilities. Um, and I just I, I think that the, the the answer in part um, to, to the previous question I'm going to cheat is that we were so lucky in this country that we um, have a vibrant and active uh, indigenous movement um, and, and indigenous ways of, of knowing um, about the economy. Uh, the economy is a way that we take care of ourselves and each other and we should own it and we should um, and that that includes women and that includes everybody um, in society. So there's a there's a big uh, source of knowledge there that we should be tapping when we have this conversation, which is um, around the, the first peoples of this land. Steve, do you want to jump in? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it goes back to like how we the way that we value contributions, and um, when it's not wage work, you know, it it gets dismissed, and not that there are systems in place that make that happen, and. You can look at data and how women in the same position are pay, paid compared to men across the board, and it's less. And and um, you know, again, like <laughs> if you put food in front of a goat, it'll eat it. If you like create a situation where you can pay women less, they'll do it. And um, you know, there there's a, like a lot of social reasons behind that. But I mean, going back to like this question of I mean, this gets back to why I made the piece, which is. So, okay, you're female in living today, right? Is capitalism working in your life? If we're pretty sure based on the data, you're getting paid a fraction of what you should compared to men. Um, is that a system that's working? Um, even if you're being paid fairly, if that's how this, if you're, if you're a man in that world, is that working for you? You know, and, um, and, and to, to think about that and then, from there, when you, if you, I hopefully you decide that that is not something that you, if you were making an economic system, you would include, um, then how do we go about changing it, right? What do we do? Okay, Joel, you've got about a minute here. Uh, capitalism both exploits and uh, creates division, and uh, it takes advantage of, of cultural uh, tropes. For example, slavery was justified by cultures that suggested that African Americans were less than human. Colonialism was justified in the same way. So capitalism both rides on top of existing cultures of racism, of sexism, uh, to devalue labor or to value it not at all in the case of slavery, uh, or to devalue land and just walk in and take it away from indigenous peoples. So it plays those cultural tropes. It also reinforces those cultural tropes. That's what's happening to a large extent uh, with, with women within capitalism. Thank you all. That's all the time for questions that we have today. And I'll, I'll let Jorge jump in here. Wow, thank you, everyone. What a phenomenal conversation. Uh, we went into so many topics. Um, and thank everyone 
thank you to everyone who jumped into the chat and shared resources. Um, a lot of people were asking about saving the chat because it's full of amazing links. So there is a button there in the chat. It's the three little dots in the bottom right corner. You can save the entire chat of this conversation. Um, thank you, Alejandra, Joel, Steve, Anita, for being here today um, and for the audience for all your participation. It's really a pleasure to do this. And um, if you want to watch the event again, or if you have friends who missed it and you want them to watch it, uh, there's a YouTube a link that we're going to share in the, in the chat. And that's basically the channel of the cultural programming team where this event will be there for viewing afterwards. Um, we are a public institution and our job is to do public programs that work for you. So your feedback is really important. So we keep getting better at this. So we're going to share a little link to a form. Uh, it takes you about a minute to fill out. I promise you it does not go into a dark hole of the internet. My colleague Candy and I read these after every event to make sure we um, take in your feedback. So please fill that out. It takes you one minute. And um, if you want to read more about or come to other events like this, please follow us on all of our social media channels or sign up for a newsletter so you can stay in the loop. We're sharing that link as well. And lastly, before I let you all go, I'm going to tell you about two upcoming events that are uh, coming up very soon. One of them is uh, with David Pevsner. So this is going to be a conversation about ageism and body shaming. Uh, David Pevsner and Andrea Verhun are going to talk about this. David Pevsner, who starred in Grey's Anatomy, as you may remember. And then on February the 2nd, we're hosting a conversation that's really tied to what we're talking about today, which is about consumerism and what it's going to take for us to keep us from consuming the entire world. And that's going to be with Michael Harris and Anjali Apaturai on February 2nd. So I hope you can all join us for those two events as well. Now, that's it for today. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you to our panel. It's been wonderful. Um, and we're going to keep the event open for a few minutes just so that people can actually look through the chat and click on things and keep some tabs open. So it's going to be open for five minutes. But in the meantime, I'm going to say goodbye and the panelists are going to leave the stage. So thank you, everyone, for being here. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.